will call the February 23rd, 2021 Town Council meeting to order. We will begin as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As you can see, we're working a modified in-person format here for the Council. Uh, all of our viewers will be on Zoom, and as such, we will be uh, taking questions from Zoom. Uh, item agenda C is public comment, and we will have this in two formats. The first stage will be Paul Ray, the town clerk, will read any written uh, notes that have come in. The second, we will go to Zoom. Uh, Paul. Uh, I have one comment for you, CJ. Uh, maybe now just by some of this. With the potential of a June 3rd referendum for the high school building project, that's approaching. I was concerned to hear a discussion about the 1928 building at this late date. I understand that this building may have sentimental value for residents I respect your desire to be thoughtful and careful about what to do with it. However, I believe if this is not resolved by the June vote, the project will be voted down because residents will want to know what's going on with this building. As you know, we cannot afford for this to not pass yet. <clears throat> I have followed this process closely. I am in favor of demolition of the building, has no use, and the renovation is right. If the couple doesn't want to be the Follow. one, Paul, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you bring your microphone closer to you? Right. If the council doesn't want to be the one determining demolition, then please consider adding the $1 million moss ball into the largest project and let the voters decide if it's worth renovating in the very near future. If you're not going to go with demolition, then the 1928 building should be treated separately with a clear and distinct plan. It should be up to the voters to determine if they would like to take on the additional $9 million cost, and then an ad hoc committee to be formed to explore potential uses, not before. Time is of the essence to rebuild a failing building. Please don't let this one aspect slow it down. I am also concerned about waiting to decide until 2024 demolition date. I believe that this will most certainly delay the project, extend the traffic issues that will come with it, and disrupt students as the campus will need to, reconfigure once it is determined that the building will be in terms of parking, etc. I respectfully ask that you explore the following when making this decision. What is the impact of waiting? How much time, construction, and traffic would it add to the project as it stands if the 1928 building is renovated and used? Is this building actually historic? Yes, it has sentimental value, and yes, it has an attractive landmark. But is it of historical value to the community? Is it worth $9.5 million? Consider needs versus wants. We need a new high school now. Do we want to salvage a building because it has sentimental value and possibly delay or negate something that, is, that this council has worked hard to move forward? Thanks, Paul. Uh, we will now turn to Anna. If you will raise your hand virtually, please state your name and we will be trying to limit comments to five minutes uh, in respect for the other people who would wish to speak. Yeah. All right, Tim Kelly, I unmuted your mic if you want to speak. Yes, thank you. Um, just a quick sound check, can you hear me okay? Yeah, Tim. Terrific. Uh, Tim Kelly, 62 Westview Terrace. I want to comment on the school system capital request. So the council members, uh, Good page ahead, maybe, and refer to attachment two spreadsheet in the agenda package. Setting aside the uh, the new high school building proposal, the annual request is for four million dollars from the BOE, and it looks as though we're trying to cram a couple three years into one budget cycle at this point. Now, the first line item for technology is certainly important. It's really the backbone of everything we do now. However, the sixth line item on the report is for an FHS roof replace. 
which makes absolutely no sense given the current plan to demolish the majority of the facility, maybe all of it. I'd like to suggest a different approach for dealing with some of the other line items um, on this uh, school request list. Like it or not, the federal government has already approved 113 billion for K through 12 schools and will shortly earmark an additional 129 billion. We should package up several of these projects and set them aside for federal COVID relief funding. And we should have a specific point person pursuing this. So as an example, we're looking for 185,000 for what I'm gonna call COVID resistant furniture. So that might be something that goes in a different column or the West District uh, COVID damaged flooring replacement. Or below that, we could combine a couple of line items, district-wide mechanical and structural could be COVID related ventilation and structural improvements. So if you take off the FHS roof for 120 and then look at those other four line items, that takes you up to 1.2 million of uh, either not doing or funding a different way. And then the other large item that stands out to me is the IAR cafeteria, which seems to be a nice to have right now, uh, certainly helpful, but perhaps not urgent. And that's 1.3 million. Or, you know, that may be a shovel ready social distancing project for COVID funding. Uh, anyway, when you go through that, you can very quickly come up with 2.5 million. Uh, which could be again subtracted from the $4 million school capital request. Um, and I guess I, I look for your thoughtful consideration in terms of separating these items into uh, the ones we have to do pronto and maybe the ones that can be uh, uh, set in a different column uh, looking towards uh, federal funding that may be flowing downhill in our direction. Thank you. the only hand up. Okay. Does anyone else have public comment? All right. Seeing none, we'll be moving on to item D1. Paula. The public hearing is called for at 6.06 p.m. Comment at farmington.org or by call. Um, yeah. I'll call that senior research. Sure. A public hearing will be held on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021 at 6 p.m. online via Zoom webinar on the town manager's proposed seven year capital improvement plan. Comments can be sent to the town council until 12 noon on February 23rd, 2021. And are accepted via email to public comment at farmington-cc.org or by calling 860-673-8282 and leaving a voicemail. Please pro provide your name and address when emailing or calling in for public comment. Calling and comments are limited to five minutes. Please call the town manager's office at 860-675-2350 with any questions. David Farmington, Connecticut, the 11th day of February 2021, Kathy A. Blonsky, County Manager. Thank you, Paul. Okay. We're now going to watch our video of the public hearing. It's moving night.
the Blonsky Town Manager, and tonight I am presenting the 21-22-27-28 Capital Improvement Program. The Capital Improvement Plan, CIP, is the planning document by which the Town of Farmington plans for the improvements it will undertake over the next seven years. For a project to qualify as a capital improvement, the cost of the item or project should be at least $25,000 and the improvement should have a useful life of at least five years. Equipment or projects which cost less than $25,000 or which have useful lives of less than five years do not qualify as a capital improvement and should be included as an expense in the operating budget. Although a capital improvement may have a recurring or ongoing operating expense related to its purchase or construction, that expense is not included in the CIP, but is included in the operating budget. Projects in the CIP may be funded from a variety of sources, appropriations, bonding, a state or federal grant, or another source of funds. Highlights of the Town of Farmington Capital Improvement Policy are as follows. The town will strive to maintain a high reliance on pay-as-you-go financing for its capital improvements. The town's objective will be to contribute at least 2.5% of the operating budget's annual general fund revenue to the capital improvement plan. The capital improvement plan calls for the expenditure of $207,748,166 over the next seven years. Of this amount, $46,164,166 is proposed to be funded through appropriations from the general fund. Bonding authorizations totaling $133,759,000 are also proposed. Other appropriations include anticipated state reimbursement for the Farmington High School building project, totaling $27,500,000, and $100,000 for the skate park at Tunxis Mead, and $150,000 for new sidewalks in Farmington Village Center. A reappropriation of $75,000 for a highway maintenance, maintenance truck is budgeted in fiscal year 21-22. The town's capital improvement policy and the town's strategic plan were the policy guidelines that were at the forefront when formulating the CIP. Last year, due to COVID-19 and financial uncertainties, the town significantly reduced capital expenditures. This CIP attempts to make up for the minimal capital budget in fiscal year 21. Fiscal year 21-22 of the Capital Improvement Plan calls for the expenditure of $145,786,166. Of this amount, $4,227,166 is proposed to be funded through appropriations from the general fund, and $113,734,000 is proposed to be funded through bonding. 27,750,000 is proposed to be funded through other funds, state grants, and $75,000 is a reappropriation. Equipment Infrastructure Maintenance Improvement Summary. Each year in the capital budget, we strive to make steady progress in this area. There is a continuous need to maintain the town's equipment and infrastructure, and these needs touch all departments. Each department has equipment replacement plans. This critical equipment keeps our volunteer firefighters safe when responding to calls for service. It allows our roads to be properly maintained by the highway and ground staff. It also keeps our school grounds, parks, and golf course looking clean and ready for play during the warm weather months. Equipment replacement ensures the town's ability to offer high quality services to our residents and businesses. This capital improvement plan proposes to fund equipment purchases for the replacement of turnout gear and a medic truck for the fire department, as well as a large dump truck and a bobcat tool cat for the public works department. These purchases fund equipment that is used every day. They respond to calls for service to our residents and maintain the rails to trails, fields, and town roads. Infrastructure improvements are an important component of this capital plan. Streetscape improvements on Main Street in Farmington continue to be funded. These funds will be combined with grant dollars and prior funding for replacement sidewalks in accordance with the quality of life improvements recommended in the Village Center Streetscape Master Plan. This funding is for phase one of the sidewalk improvement plan that will start at Route 4 and proceed to the Highland Park Plaza on the west side and Main Gate on the east side, which includes a segment of new sidewalk. 
The proposed capital improvement plan continues to fund renovations and or improvements to town owned buildings or properties. Funding for the upcoming year is proposed to continue funding renovations at the Stone House, the town hall, and to begin a significant renovation project for the three main fire stations with startup funds for a newly established building committee. Funds are also included to make needed repairs at the police range house, as well as a fund for unanticipated repairs to various buildings as the need arises. With our newest buildings approaching 20 years old, unanticipated repairs are on the rise. Several large unanticipated repairs were seen in the past few years, and this CIP attempts to have funds available for those unanticipated repairs. Technology and communication summary. In the 21st century, a town's technology infrastructure must be maintained. It must keep up with the rapidly changing world of technology, as well as the expectations of residents and businesses. Townwide technology improvements, as well as improvements specific to the police department, fire department, and the town hall are proposed in this capital improvement plan. The capital improvement plan will provide funds to the police department for the purchase of body cameras. Body cameras are now a required piece of equipment under the recent police accountability bill. Officers will have both body cameras and in-car video cameras. The body cameras will have ongoing yearly cost as well as replacement cost in the future. Funding to purchase additional interoperable portable radios is also proposed for the police department. Line officers will have these radios and will be able to communicate with other agencies who use different radio frequencies. Funding will continue a multi-phase communication upgrade in the fire department. These funds will replace obsolete mobile and portable radios. Technology is constantly evolving and the proposed capital improvement plan will continue to provide routine technology improvements to town hall and other town facilities, allowing all departments to deliver public goods and services effectively and efficiently. I will now review the budget in detail. Proposed bonding. I will now summarize the first year of proposed bonding, other funding, and reappropriations. Board of Education, $110 million, Farmington High School building project. This is the projected net municipal cost with an anticipated June referendum. $1,284,000, IAR cafeteria addition and renovation. $450,000, Noah Wallace partial roof replacement. Engineering Department, $2 million for road reconstruction. Proposed other funding. This capital plan includes $27,500,000 in anticipated state reimbursement for the Farmington High School building project, $100,000 for Tungsis Mead improvements, which would be the skateboard park, and $150,000 for the Planning Department for Farmington Center improvements specifically the sidewalks in Farmington Village to Highland Park Market Plaza. Reappropriation. A reappropriation of 75,000 is for a highway maintenance truck. General fund cash appropriations. I will now summarize the department request for the first year of the capital improvement plan. Board of Education. The Board of Education is recommending $2,197 $166 for Board of Education projects. The Board of Education will be addressing these projects in detail after this presentation. I am recommending $125,000 in the Engineering Department for light pole replacements, bridge repairs, and environmental compliance. I am recommending $308,000 in the Highway Department that includes irrigation improvements for our athletic fields and various equipment replacements. I am recommending $150,000 to the Planning Department. Funds will be combined with grant dollars and prior funding to complete Phase 1, which is the replacement of sidewalks on Main Street. I am recommending $357,000 in the Fire Department, which will be used for the replacement of turnout gear, a multi-phase communication upgrade, Knox boxes, apparatus replacement, and funds to enable a new fire station building committee to begin work with an architect. I am recommending $325,000 in the Police Department. This includes funding for a new supervisor SUV, technology improvements, 
a communication upgrade, and funding for shooting range improvements. I'm recommending 590,000 in the town manager's office. This includes technology upgrades, town hall improvements, building and equipment improvements, reevaluation costs, and land record re-indexing. I'm recommending 175,000 in community and recreation to continue renovations on the exterior and interior of the stone house and to begin youth center repairs and improvements in accordance with a recently completed facility study. The capital budget attempts to make up for some of the lost ground from the previous year's CIP. This capital budget will allow us to make headway to meet the town's capital improvement needs. The Police Accountability Act has required significant funding needs in the police department and revaluation funds are also required and cannot be delayed. The cost of maintaining the town's infrastructure through the CIP is a necessary expense that must be recognized. The need for funds to maintain the town's property, buildings, and equipment is often greater than the willingness of the town to appropriate funds to meet those needs. However, the cost of not maintaining the town's property, building, and equipment will have a significant long-term impact. It may be tempting to defer a cost today to save money. However, the cost of deferred maintenance and repairs does not disappear. It accumulates and will likely increase in the future. The proposed first year cash appropriation is $4,227,166 with the town's portion at $2,030,000 and the board's portion at $2,197,166. This is well above what we have historically been funding for capital projects, not including the significantly reduced funding from last year. Since 2005, through the town's capital improvement policy, our capital plan strives to contribute at least 2.5% of the annual general fund revenues allocated to the operating budget. A capital budget of 2.5% would be 2,822,000. The town council direction was to try to raise the capital plan this year. Using 3%, the capital plan would be 3,386,000. That would be a reduction of $841,166. I look forward to working with the town council tonight as we review my proposed capital improvement plan. This seven year plan adequately reflects the needs of the town. Moreover, the proposed plan exceeds our policy guidelines. I will now turn the presentation over to Superintendent Greeter and her team to present the Board of Education's request. Good evening, Farmington Community, Board of Education, and Town Council. This is Alicia Bowman, Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations for the Farmington Public Schools, and it is my pleasure to present the Farmington Board of Education's capital budget to you this evening. Guided by our philosophy, the development of our capital budget priorities is a collaborative and strategic planning opportunity for the school district administration and the Board of Education. The Farmington Public Schools K-8 Facilities Review informs our short and long-term facility goals that we continue to prioritize in the budget process. Then as a central office team, we assess the recommendations from our school leaders, the comprehensive facility review, and up-to-date safety and security guidance to develop our capital budget proposal for the 2021-2022 school year and beyond. And that is what we are sharing with you this evening. My colleagues, Matt Ross, Director of Technology, and Sam Kilpatrick, Director of Facilities, and I will walk you through the 14 buckets of our capital improvement requests. 
As in the past, we use this system of organizing our proposals into buckets to align with the town's approach to developing and implementing a capital budget. The buckets include technology infrastructure, school security, IAR cafeteria addition, school code and safety, cafeteria equipment, roof replacement at FHS, Noah Wallace partial roof replacement, classroom furniture, West District corridor flooring, district-wide MEP, structural and architectural, telephone system, replacement of vehicles, and the FHS mascot. Despite a very difficult year with many unexpected facility needs, we are proud of all that we have been able to accomplish in the 2020-2021 school year. We were able to complete second grade classroom furniture, which completes our elementary furniture upgrade throughout the district, the Westwoods dehumidification project, installation of the Westwoods playground, the new Union School electrical upgrade, and the replacement of our mechanics vehicle. In addition, we had many COVID-19 uh, related expenses that weren't anticipated, including upgrades and reprogramming of building automation equipment, we commissioned an engineering firm to complete a thorough analysis of our ventilation systems district-wide and the exhaust ventilation upgrade projects at Union and No Wallace schools. We also have several projects that are currently in process. Overall, you will see that our total capital improvement request is $3,931,166. I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Matt Ross, Director of Technology, to share with you our technology requests for 2021-22. Thank you, Alicia. The total amount requested in Board of Education Technology Capital Improvement for 2021 to 2022 is $550,000 and is in line with our seven-year projected capital plan. Due to significant reductions in capital funding for 2020-2021, several projects were delayed or are being pushed back by a year. This slide illustrates the various technology investment buckets in which we are proposing capital improvement dollars. Classroom AV upgrades, network equipment, and data room business continuity and disaster recovery, or BCDR, are areas that were reduced in the 2020-2021 capital improvement budget, and we are now looking to pick up where we left off. Additionally, in accordance with our technology capital plan, desktop computer replacements have come back around to another multi-year phased replacement cycle. As mentioned in previous years, these desktop replacements are typically spread over three years with an expected five-year lifespan on the devices. Security. This area provides funding for the continued phasing and upgrading of security measures within the district according to the Farmington Police Department's recommendations and the K-8 Facilities Review Report recommendations. A significant amount of this request is for the planned systematic replacement of components of the security system, which are reaching or have reached their life expectancy. We are also looking to expand our camera coverage in strategic locations and to continue with other security enhancements, such as window film and access control. I will now turn it over to Sam Kilpatrick, Director of Facilities, to review the remaining items. Thank you, Matt. We are requesting $1,284,000 for the renovation of the Irvin Robbins Cafeteria and Food Service Area. This amount includes $84,000 for design development, which had been approved in last year's budget process, but subsequently reduced due to the pandemic. In addition to that, we have also included the budgetary placeholder from the Friar Report of $1.2 million to facilitate construction in the summer of 2022. Noted in the Friar Report, the Irving Robbins cafeteria is undersized for the student enrollment. These snapshots from building floor plans show that the space is about 75% of the size of three classrooms there. This capacity constraint necessitates four lunch waves, a scheduling dilemma that limits flexibility in academic scheduling. To maintain compliance with fire and life safety codes, we are requesting $100,000 in this account. 
Projects included are Union Doors and East Farms Fire Door Hardware, which were deferred due to reductions in budget. Noah Wallace Exterior Lighting is a project that my predecessor had planned for this fiscal year request and is pictured in this slide. Our request of $91,000 for cafeteria equipment reflects an assessment that much of our kitchen equipment is of the same vintage and is reaching the end of its life cycle. We need to prioritize systematic replacement to avoid mounting repair costs, or more importantly, interruption to program. This amount includes a steamer at the high school, which was deferred last year, and a piece of equipment at each school in the district. $120,000 is for repairs to the high school roof. With the high school building project not yet decided, we continue to experience water infiltration, particularly in the two areas indicated on this slide. We have done spot repairs and added roof drains, but the issues still persist. This allocation would allow us to do a more comprehensive repair though still well short of the $650,000 project that it would be to replace the entire yellow section on this roof plan. Noah Wallace Roof Replacement. Part of last year's request, we are again seeking $450,000 to replace the two roof sections indicated on this slide. This would complete the roof project at Noah Wallace and would also complete the roof replacement cycle for the district K through eight. Our furniture request is $185,000. This is a continuation of our district replacement cycle to a more modern, collaborative and flexible style that is proving successful at all grade levels. Delayed this past year due to COVID-19, the first phase of Irving Robbins replacements will be classroom furniture. Originally proposed as an abatement and replacement project, West District Corridor Flooring was included last year as an overlay project within structural architectural account, but it was deferred due to budget reductions. This year, we have separated it out as a standalone project to simplify the process of seeking state reimbursement for the abatement and replacement project that was originally proposed. Our MEP request is $410,000. A number of the MEP projects listed here are continued phased projects. New projects to this list include the replacement of thermal wheels in the heat exchange system at Westwoods and the removal of one of the three remaining underground oil tanks in the district. $260,000 is requested for structural and architectural projects, which are listed here. Projects pictured here include continued replacement of flooring at Noah Wallace on the top left, a full assessment and design for repairs to the Noah Wallace facade on the lower left. On the bottom right, similar to the West District project, Irving Robbins is in need of flooring replacement, which would also start with corridors. And on the top right is the West District chimney, which appears to need a new cap and repairs to the brick masonry. Telephone system. This bucket is a banking bucket in which we are beginning to build back capital dollars for an expected phone system upgrade in 2025. In our replacement of vehicles bucket, we are asking to bank funds for the future replacement of our district suburbans. In the FHS mascot bucket, these funds are for potential projects as a result of the newly adopted school mascot. Funds may be necessary for the turf, scoreboards, and other signage replacements. The K-8 facility review report guides our out years or future capital projects as well. Exam
Examples of future capital projects include the replacement of vehicles, telephone system upgrade, mechanical system improvements at Westwood's Upper Elementary School, which is reaching a milestone age of 20 years, and repairs to the No Wallace School facade. So again, in sum, this is our capital improvement request. It's a reflection of ensuring that we continue to follow the recommendations of the K facility report, that we are staying up to date with code um, safety security, as well as thinking of lasting implications of COVID-19 protocols and restoring some of the projects that we were not able to accomplish in last year's budget cycle. And lastly, hard to read on this slide, but you all received a copy in your packet. It's just an outlook on our seven year capital improvement budget. I think that wraps up our presentation and I think the next item would be any public comment for the budget. We'll go to the public, if anyone would like to raise their hand and have any comments on the public hearing of the proposed seven year capital improvement. Seeing no hands raised. Thank you. Okay, no public comment. Six thirty six. We will be closing the public hearing. Agenda item E one to make a motion to consider the fiscal year twenty twenty one through twenty twenty two to twenty twenty seven through twenty twenty eight seven year capital improvement plan. Joe Kevin, second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? So see your um your and what the, as on the second page, and what's going to happen now is that the Board of Education is going to be joining you, the staff. I'm going to be leaving, but I'll be upstairs and Joe and is up and my staff. We have you slated for about an hour, just to let you know on the timing. Um, after the Board of Education is done, we'll take a, a quick break and we have some box lunches, I mean box dinner, some sandwiches. We'll have that, and then we'll start with my department heads. We'll be back, and we have the fire, public works, community, rack, police department, and then my office. Um, so that's the schedule for today. Typically, you guys do not see any action on a capital plan, and that you do that is the reason for this meeting is so we have our regular uh, budget in about two weeks, and this gives you um, more time to go through the capital, so then at the March meeting, you can uh, focus on the operating budget and then review this a little bit less than you would have to. Mm -hmm. and so with that, if you need it, uh, Joe or I will be listening upstairs and we can either uh, go through the phone or we'll come downstairs, but the board is um, out in the hallway and we're just gonna, I'm just gonna clean up a little bit and then go on upstairs. Very good. Okay. And just for the public, what we're doing is rotating in and out uh, the different departments. We're going to start with the town manager leaving the office, cleaning the workspace, uh, making space for the Board of Education to come in, uh, and we will do the same throughout the evening when we're bringing in different departments. Okay, so with that, we will much easier than working through Zoom, where we could actually be in the same space, separated by our partitions and six feet wearing our masks, and actually being able to have a conversation without the worry of someone losing connections, which was often me when I was in the town. <coughs> The next group in. Very good. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah. Usually, at the end of each session, you, you have a tentative approval of that session. Okay. Thank you. We should have space for every other chair up there, hopefully, for you.
there's something odd about doing a budget while wearing masks. <laughs> okay, we're up on Board of Education. Thank you, CJ, and uh, good evening, everyone. And um, you know, I just want to thank you for having us here, um, having us here in, in person. Um, you know, as we, as we already presented our 2021-22 capital presentation, but I just want to take a moment to introduce who's here. We have our superintendent of schools, Kathy Greeter. We have Alicia Bowman, our Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations, our Director of Technology, Matt Ross, and our, uh, we have welcomed a new Director of Facilities, Sam Kostakis. So, um, he's with us here tonight. So, you did their uh, presentation, and so, um, you know, what you, what you saw tonight really shows the continued commitment that um, the Farmington Public Schools, um, you know, have to our K-8 facilities review recommendations, and you also see the board's responsibility to maintain safe schools and make sure our schools are up to date and are um, compliant with current build with current building codes. And most importantly, um, that our buildings make sure that they support our educational programming. So, as Alicia said, uh, as we all know, last year was extremely difficult, um, you know, due to the unanticipated COVID crisis. It was very challenging. But I think last year, I'm very grateful. We worked together as a board and a council, council and we worked collaboratively. And we shared in the tough choices and the tough decisions and the tough reductions um, in the budget. It was very difficult, but um, you know, it's my hope that the news is better and that we find uh, our town a uh, more positive financial outlook. So with that in mind, you saw our capital request is a building back of reductions from last year. And keeping a solid plan to stay on pace with our K-8 facility projects, which I know is a priority for the town and, and the board. So um, we are here. We are happy to answer your questions. And just before I turn it over, I just want to say that on behalf of the Board of Education, we are so thrilled that a referendum date is being set for the Farmington High School building project. And I know we're all in agreement that our our high school is an end of life, and we need to do better for our students, we need to do better for our community, and we're just so happy to be working with you and the building committee and the community so that we can present an efficient and safer new high school facility. So we're very excited. So now I'm going to turn it over to Alicia Bowman. Thank you, Ellen. So I'd like to point out to the town council that the Union School elevator was inadvertently left on our MEP request despite prior approval in the 2019-2020 budget. This project was dependent on the electrical upgrade at Union School, which was completed this past summer. The elevator replacement is in progress, the plan for completion in the summer, this summer, 2021. So therefore, the Board of Ed's MEP request for 2021-2022 can be reduced by $200,000 for a revised total request of $210,000 for MEP. We have updated our proposals and those tactics were at your seat, um, and we have an updated presentation to reflect this adjustment. We apologize for any confusion that you may have caused. And our new total capital request is $3 million. $731,166. Any questions about that? I just wanted to make sure that's clear and that is reflected in the documents that we shared with you this evening. And like Ellen said, we look forward to further conversation with the town council regarding our capital request. Any questions on that particular? Yeah. Alicia, thank you very much. Did you say the MEP was reduced by two tenths? 
what's in this 210 or what's... So, in our presentation that we did, um, that we played for you, um, we hadn't made the adjustments and we wanted to put forth, Chris, a board approved um, budget request, so I wanted to share that reduction with you in person. So that packet that was on your um, table this evening is revised and it is reflective of the, the new request. You're welcome. So you can bring us to any of the projects, any questions that you have at this point. Um, already presented uh, the entire capital request. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kathy, and everybody for coming tonight and presenting your budget. It might be a general question. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I thought it might be good if, if we discussed this a little bit. It was touched on by Tim Kelly in, the, in his public comment. I don't know if you heard those, but it's sort of, if we can discuss holistically, I know we received some grant funding, and just COVID funding relative to how it would apply to the budget sort of holistically, not in any particular line item, but just if we can discuss that issue. So we did receive funding this year um, that helped us to not have to come to town council for additional funding. There were many COVID-related expenses that we did not anticipate when we were um, going through the approval process of the 2020-2021 budget. So in our financials each month, we share with the board what that funding has been. And um, you know, those are things like PPE, uh, cleaning supplies, because we have to do much more aggressive cleaning now. Um, barriers mm -hmm. exist for every student in our school district, as well as our offices, um, and many, many other expenses, um, and I think Technology was a huge component um, of, of how we spent the money because we had to, as you know, we um, made some reductions last year, but we also had to lift the level of our technology to provide one-to-one -one for all of our students as well as um, the access of live teaching from classrooms into homes. So. so this year was more about submitting to the state our expenses and getting reimbursement for those expenses. Going forward, um, we already know that we're getting ESSER II funds, and they are uh, not only for 21-22, but they're also for 22-23. They're based on our Title I allocation. So each district receives different amounts depending on their Title I funding from the federal level, and we received approximately $1 million, or we will receive approximately $1 million, um, dollars in that particular area. There are, we have to go through an application process and there are only a certain uh, number of uh, items that we must adhere to when we're applying for those funds. So we have already determined what those areas will be. This is all about educational recovery, knowing that our students are experiencing learning loss and we also know that we have uh, additional social, emotional, well-being issues that we're also dealing with. Um, and you can imagine we're going on a year of, um, for some students, remote learning for an entire year because they, their parents this year selected remote learning. Um, and so we know that you know between um, you know disruptions, whether we're in hybrid or students who have selected remote only, and even in person, it's very different. Just like it's very different tonight <laughs> in our in-person meetings. And that has an effect on our students. So knowing that and knowing the research that we're seeing right now, just the impact of hybrid versus in-person versus remote, we are experiencing a level of learning loss for our students that we um, are trying to accelerate right now. But those funds are absolutely targeted for learning acceleration and uh, mental health and social emotional well-being. Also family connections that we can make, um, we can use that money for that. Um, and uh, so it's, it's acceleration, interventions, um, social emotional well-being, 
and um, I'm trying to family of orange. And they do have actually an area for ventilation <laughs> system in Esther 2. So those are the buckets. And uh, you know, our Esther 2 funding, we've determined we would use half in 22, sorry, 21, 22, 500,000, and half in 22, 23, because we do see this as a two year recovery. And so that's how we're going to utilize the funds. And we have plans. Um, we, we have to fill out an, applica an application for those funds and a needs assessment. And so we already have determined some of the areas that we will be utilizing those funds for. Oh, another area is remote learning. So you can use some of it uh, to enhance your remote learning program. Uh, so that's basically how that's going to work. So we did not put those things, all those different areas, we did not put in our operating budget because we felt that that was more it was more appropriate to be funded through ESSER two funds. So when you see our operating budget in March, you'll see that we separated those outside of our operating budget, those areas, so that we can between our operating budget and ESSER two funds really support our students through this very difficult time that we've been through the last year and that we will continue to go through as we look forward to the 21-22 school year. We know that masks and mitigation practices will most likely be in place uh, in 21-22. We're also hearing from the governor right now that there is a chance that remote learning will also continue. And so we're waiting to hear uh, about that as well because there are additional um, Cost to doing that. Okay, thank you, Doug. Other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, th first of all, thank you to all of you for, for your hard work and uh, for being here today. It's great to see everybody <laughs> and for your for your presentation as well. Thank you. Uh, my question is on the IAR cafeteria addition renovation. Uh, so we heard a little bit about it in the presentation. I was hoping that you could expand a little bit more on that. I think in the presentation we heard there's three lunch waves right now. Um, so would the addition renovation reduce that to two lunch waves, or would there still be three lunch waves? And it's, um, if you could talk a little bit to how it's currently undersized. Um, and then looking at kind of like um, on um, – I think page 11 here, where it shows the the, um, the schematics of uh, kind of what it looks like here. You have kind of three classrooms there, so mm -hmm. would it be replacing three? Well, part of this replace three existing classrooms. Can you just provide a little bit of clarity, kind of all, on all of those points. Sure. Do you want? Okay. So um, the diagram is just to illustrate the size, how undersized the cafeteria is. So basically, just to show you that it's equal to about. Um, would you say two and a half classrooms, Sam, or two and three quarters or so, just to show you the, how the proportion of the current cafeteria. Um, it seats 160 students at a time. And of course, that's not in COVID time, that's in real, real time. Um, and IR is approximately 690 students. It takes up about two hours of the school day for lunch waves, and it's, it's purely undersized for the number of students. It's also something that was noted in the prior report. Um, you know, I think just at this time, we'd like to be able to not have our facility drive our instructional programming, and that's unfortunately what's happening. So there's that component, the instructional component, and then just the actual facility itself doesn't suit the number of students at that school. Gotcha. So with the addition and renovation, you mentioned that there's now a two-hour block of time that's required for lunch. How, does, does that get reduced? Yes, definitely. So what would that approximately be reduced? To? So the goal, without going into all of the details, but the goal really is to shift the, the scheduling at the middle school, and we've been unable to do that to look more like the high school with longer chunks, longer periods, also known as block scheduling, and this would allow us to do that. Um, right now, our lunch periods are equal to our instructional time, and that's not how we would want it. We would want our lunch periods to be significantly less than an instructional block. Mm -hmm. And again, without going so into the into the weeds of it, 
um, it, it really is a driver of the school schedule and it's limiting um, opportunities for kids as well because um, that longer chunk takes up four blocks within the school day and we'd like to reduce that. Um, I don't, I think the benefit is to have, th or the goal, I'm sorry, is to have three lunch waves instead of four. Okay, so there's currently four and it would be reduced to three. Mm -hmm. Two per grade. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, just a, uh, thank you, CJ. Um, just to follow up with Ed's question, uh, obviously the board is considering other issues that um, these farms with the population. Mm -hmm. And how does that dovetail with this project in terms of being a release valve for, you know, achieving your programmatic needs at, at the school? I don't, I don't know if there's necessarily a connection. You're saying is there a connection between East Farms and um, IAR? No, no, Sorry. just with the, the, you know, the, the overcrowding at the kindergarten level. And yeah. The, the issues you've talked about at the board meeting mm -hmm. being delayed on it. Does this dovetail or work with that in terms of providing additional meeting your programmatic needs of, let's say, or does taking some kids maybe out of East Farms to Noah Wallace help relieve the pressure on the cafeteria? This is at IAR. Not at IAR. Oh, sorry. I was, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, no, I said, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. I was going to try yeah. to make yeah. it, but <laughs> yeah. I'm like, sure. that's okay. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. they're across the street. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, a couple of things on the cafeteria. Um, maybe just for the general public, how, how long has this project been in the works? When? When did we start the design work? And maybe just start with that right there, just for people listening on, on uh, how this came about or how long we've been planning for this. So the design work is within this total amount. Uh, we had planned to do design in 2020, 2021, but it was deferred. So this was the year that the project was going to be requested. Um, we always try to do design first and then the project. So in the presentation, because of the deferment last year, um, we decided that we would still take, you know, this summer and through the 21-22, we would do design. And then in the summer of 2022, the construction would occur. Um, this has been in the works, I mean, I, it's been a few years because it's been on the seven year uh, plan. It's also part of the Friar Report, and it definitely has become a priority in recent years as we've tried, we've had many attempts to try to change the schedule mm -hmm. at IAR. Even with the current schedule, it is, it is uh, undersized. You know, not that we hope, you know, we're, we're hoping COVID at some point we don't have to do the social distancing we do now, but we're now having lunch both in this undersized cafeteria, but because it's so undersized, we have to go all throughout the building to do lunch, including using half the gymnasium, which is having programmatic impact because we can't use half the gymnasium every day. So this year it's having quite a significant impact and um, that also requires more personnel because we have to monitor students in different areas. Um, so. Even if we did not have COVID and we were um, just experiencing a normal year, we um, had to go out into the hallway mm -hmm. for students to eat because there's just simply not enough room in the cafeteria. And students are very, very close to each other when they're eating um, lunch just to try to yeah. even with the four uh, lunch ways. So um, if I, I couldn't give you an it. I could go back and just look. I would say at least three to four years. Okay, and now, now this 1.2 million, uh, this is the building cost or a combination of design fees? Just clarify, clarify that again. So what we did there was take the, the budgetary placeholder that was included within the product we put, um, just to, as a placeholder uh, to go forward. Obviously, we won't know exact construction costs until we have a design and we can do uh, proper cost but okay. it includes both the design and the, and the projected cost for construction. So 1.2 is the placeholder from the prior report for construction costs, and that you 
four thousand dollars was the amount that was ordered collected for design last year. And um, what type would this project qualify for um, some type of reimbursement for the state? Yeah. Same same kind of thing we're looking at with the high school twenty percent higher or less. Well, it, it would be considered, and Sam will tell me if I'm wrong, it, it would be considered a renovation, right? Alteration so, extension, okay. Yeah, so it would be the 28 point some, you know, it would be the higher percentage. Uh, 28, 28%. Yeah, about 28%. Okay, thank you. Brian. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm glad we're talking about a budget because that's very important, but I think it's also important to talk about the benefits and the use. And we've talked about this to the students and to the school, but we haven't talked about are the benefits to the community because I know a lot of adult education and activities go on there. Can we talk about the benefits to the overall community in addition to what's going on for the school so that we know what this is going to do for us? So I don't know, Alicia, you want to talk just about building use and sure. you know, anytime we improve our facilities and, and in, in this case it's an expanse, a bit of an expansion, it certainly has many benefits for our students but also our community. Absolutely. Um, the part of, um, if you can picture where, our, where the cafeteria is located at IAR, it's an exterior, uh, you know, on an exterior side that allows for us to expand and not really interrupt into the school building. But as far as facilities, um, this year has been a very different year. But prior to that, we have competing requests for building use um, within our community, whether it's continuing education, um, whether it is park and rec use, um, other outside groups that are looking for spaces to use. Um, so certainly, the access to the community, it just provides more access to the community. It's another space that we could um, to sh share with our residents. Um, and also at IR has the auditorium component too, which makes it a little bit more um, desirable for certain groups. And those two are, are also close by, same area as the gym. So it, it does allow for more opportunity. Great point. Just a follow-up question. Sure. And that is also a reference Correct. <laughs> so I think that's important to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. Thank you everybody for coming. Quick question on the West District flooring. You said about remote chance of reimbursement from the state. Would that be the 28% also? Is it 236, or are we looking at a different number for that? Nope, that's, that's the same reimbursement rate for that. There would not be reimbursement if you did it as an overlay project, uh, which was uh, over the last year's budget, but for, um, for an abatement and replacement, you would be able to see reimbursement. And that's just with the central corridor, or are we looking at the whole school? That's the, the whole school could, is in need of school. At, at some point, this, this would start a phase project where we start the phase one uh, by doing the corridor first. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. One quick question. Thanks for coming tonight, too. Mm -hmm. um, replacement of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at replacing suburbans or cars? Or? Yes. So we have. Um, Suburban that we use internally to transport students. Um, we have two drivers that um, not only do mail and other career um, functions throughout our district, but they're also transporting students. So um, part of our capital plan is to make sure that we are moving through those vehicles, replacing, and then shifting them to other purposes. So that is for suburban, but not for this we're not asking for it in the 21-22 budget, but rather for out years. This year we were able to replace our mechanic vehicle, which we're very grateful for. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. I just, so on, just um, on the vehicles, I thought I heard during the presentation, you're just banking, banking the money for this. Correct. Okay. And then I'm going to just kick over to the telephone. You're going to be banking money. Thanking the money for future purposes. That's what I said well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Just a note, please, everyone speak a little louder and into your microphone, Sam in particular. I've been told. <laughs> so you have to repeat everything you said. <laughs>
Okay, other question. Uh, Jeff, don't go ahead, Jeff. You got one, Peter. Well, I, I, I do and I don't. But can we, um, <laughs> I don't know where to begin on this one, but I'm going to, maybe just for the benefit of the public, on the technology infrastructure, um, what, do, what are we doing this year specifically with um, potentially the $550,000? Are we playing catch up? Are we expanding? That, that's, uh, I'll let Matt take it from there. We're doing a little bit of everything. So we are playing catch up because a lot of the money that would have gone towards classroom AV upgrades was reduced last year. Um, we uh, had to replace an, uh, on the spot several projectors that failed that were uh, kind of targeted last summer, but we held off as long as we could. Um, and we are also continuing with a portion of our normal classroom AV upgrades as if we were continuing this year as well. So that you do see a lot much larger number for classroom AV upgrades uh, in, in that section. Um, right now, we are we are still having to replace uh, projectors at the high school. Again, we're going as long as we can, uh, and what we are replacing them with are devices that could then carry over to a new building as necessary. Um, we are now coming up on the sixth year of uh, AV upgrades at the elementary school level, so we are now circling back to elementary classrooms K-4 and replacing those devices. At the time that we upgraded those, we upgraded them with projectors that required lamps. The newer technology that we're going with now are lampless uh, projectors or LCD displays, which don't have um, replaceable parts, essentially, or they don't have consumables. So uh, whereas the, the, the typical overhead projector or LCD projector that one knows has a lamp that has roughly three to 4,000 hours on it, the newer technology that we're putting in does not have those replaceable lamps. It also comes with 10-year warranties. So they last a lot longer. But the, a good chunk of that is circling back to our, our technology plan and uh, addressing K-4 classrooms. Uh, just just follow up because I'm just curious. On these projectors, are they capable of being used uh, to transmit or for the remote learning or some, in some capacity? Is it a these don't transmit. They're not transmit. Yeah, that, uh, but they are incorporated into the remote learning plan that we're using. So depending on uh, how the teacher is interacting with the remote students, uh, there are times where the uh, webcam is focused on the front of the classroom, and therefore the, the image that's being projected for the students in person is also visible for the students at home. All right, so it has a benefit that it can, it can be used for remote learning. Yeah, so a lot of times, if it's fine detail, teachers are actually sharing their screens. Yeah. So again, think of the, the projector in the room is primarily for the benefit of the students in the classroom, yeah. and the teacher is sharing their compu local computer screen for the yeah. benefit of the students at home. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. This touching on cohort C again. I know we did a survey. What numbers are we looking at? I believe at one point for the high school, we're at 50%. Yeah, it's constantly changing, and part of it is um, Farmington's plan. Our return to school plan gives um, a lot of flexibility for families. We decided not to have a separate remote school, uh, which has proven to be very challenging for school districts. So we're really happy with our planning over the summer because it created flexibility uh, for the school district, but even more so for families. And so students can be on remote and then not be on remote and the parents just let us know. Um, sometimes students might not feel well in the morning and they're an in-person student, but they decide that day they're going to be remote. But I would say that we have 30 to 40% pretty consistently on remote uh, learning this year, which is live streaming from the classroom um, and not a separate remote school, which um, many school districts had selected. and. I was on a meeting today and many of them will not select that model if we have to do it again next year and have a more flexible model because we really do want to be uh, responsive to our community and as case rates go up, sometimes families make different decisions um, depending on that and also just family circumstances. So typically it's um, about 30 to 40% right now. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, district-wide, but it can be very different depending on each school. And so we do report out to the board at every board meeting where we are at a particular point. Um, our high school is scheduled to go back full in person on March 8th. And we would move away from hybrid at that point. Uh, as all of you know, we've seen a steady decline in case rates in Farmington, and both internal and external data suggest that it's time to move to full in person. So we've been full in person K-8, um, and now we'll shift from hybrid at our high school to full in person on March 8th. So if they are in cohort C now at the high school, they will not be able to anymore, they will have to be going in. Oh no, cohort C is something that exists all year yeah. long this year for, for the governor's executive order and the Connecticut State Department of Education. So even when I, when I say full in person, Cohort C is is still available for families. Okay, and that obviously you would have the numbers from your survey to say to show a lot of them are coming back or intended to come back when they sent the survey uh, out. For the high school, I think it was a little over 60 percent that are planning um, to be in person once we shift uh, to on March 8th. Okay. But that that's always changing. <laughs> And seemingly is just about everything during the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Other questions? I'll do one more. Yeah. On the uh, <clears throat> potential no Wallace uh, roof replacement, is there still a state um, fund where we are eligible for funding for that still? Yes. Yes. That's why we separate out roof projects. Yep. Yep. Um, because we um, then submit back to the state and we will get reimbursement on the roof project. Do you know what the approximate reimbursement rate is on roof? Same rate. It's Same rate. 28 points. 28 points. So it'd be 28 percent of 450. Okay, but we always budget the 450. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And speaking of roofs then, for the high school 120, um, if, the, if that does get passed in new high school, does this roof still need to be repaired or without this be pushed off knowing that the high school is going to be built? So the way we're looking at it is this is a repair that will get us through a construction period um, for, for a new high school. So we, we currently have water infiltration that we've tried a number of mitigations and haven't been out. So we believe this is a necessary repair to those two sections. Right. Just for clarification, it's not a roof replacement, mm -hmm. it's a roof repair. That's correct. Okay. It's a repair. Just to clarify. Mm -hmm. And that, that would not, a repair would not be reimbursable. as well 
we just thought it would be um, important to make sure that we're not utilizing it all in one year and then have a need for it in 22, 23 and not have the funding available. Just trying to be thoughtful about that funding is unusual for Farmington to get uh, funding like that, so we really want to be thoughtful and careful about it. Sure. You did mention there was money that had come in uh, submitted and reimbursed. Do you have any idea how much in COVID that you've already uh, received? Yes, so we can get that for yeah. you. Again, these are all submitted reimbursement, so um, we had to spend the money to get them. And this is for ESSER funds and coronavirus relief funds. Um, Again, the allocations were given to us, and actually for the CRF funds, um, we had an opportunity to request more, which we jumped on, and we were able to, because if you had your, um, if you had your expenditures organized and ready to go, you were able to receive additional funds, which was great. So we were able to actually get more than we were originally allocated. I'll get that number for you. I've got the answer. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Answer funds was two hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars. So it was uh, for, and that's considered answer one, mm -hmm. not answer two. It was two twenty-nine nine seven nine, and then CRF um, four sixty-six six six eight. I think I need glasses. That's correct. <laughs> you might need glasses, but that is the right number. <laughs> That's the advantage of the computer screen. It's large without the glasses. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? And just to reiterate what Kathy said, CJ, uh, regarding those funds, they had to be expended during a certain period of time. We had to submit during a certain period of time, um, and they were very tight timelines. Actually, last spring, we had to say what we thought we were going to spend the money on. We didn't even know what was going on at that time, but um, fortunately, we were able to just keep track of everything. And, it, and we were actually given more. Correct. Because mm -hmm. we had everything ready to go, so they gave us more than what, what they originally had provided us. So that's so the uh, 466 and change and 229, is, those are all basically getting things refunded in 40 cents. Those are all refunded. Brian has a question. Thank you. Uh, were any of those extra funds for capital expenses? <coughs> I believe that um, the ventilation, right? That was the one you mentioned earlier. Just Would that have come from that? I'm not sure. The that. ventilation was it, we were able to use from capital funds, um, but a lot of the, the things that we've expended, like I said, were technology, um, PPE, um, we had to move furniture out of our buildings, store furniture, we had to buy plastic dividers, all of the really unanticipated expenditures that we did not plan for at this time last year was what we used. I don't know actually if Esther once had a facility really. It did not. It could not. Use, okay. So this is new for Esther too. That's so correct. That added the ventilation. Um, you know, because it was um, such an issue. I was going to say, say the school district incurred a lot of feedback from school districts about how they said we could use the funds and when we had to tell, you know, how we had to make projections on how we would use the funds. And ventilation certainly was something that districts spent a lot of money on, so I think they got that message. Okay, so if I understand correctly, we, we spent a lot of money, not on capital things. Uh, so we got reimbursed for it, and it can't, even though we got that money because it's reimbursing and other things, it can't go to any capital expenditures. Right, I mean, every time we've received this fund, there are restrictions. Right, on so it's just not money we can put our so we want. It's got to go back to the things that it went to that what it was allowed for. Right, that's correct. And, then the, and again, this last one, or the one, the effort two is more about looking forward and we have to complete a needs assessment and an application <coughs> for those funds. And we are being told by the Connecticut State Department of Education that it's to supplement your budget, not to supplant it. And um, that's you know mm -hmm. a real distinction here is that this has to <coughs> not be taking things out of your budget to then use for S or two, but instead to really focus on those things like learning loss and learning acceleration and student uh, you know, uh, mental health and well-being, 
and um, we remote learning and family uh, engagement and support, just knowing the context of what's going on. But ventilation is in SR2 as an allowable expense. Sounds like those are the expenses we never really had before. Right, right. Okay. That's one of the little clarifications, thank you. Other questions? Uh, one other. Um, Laura and I, I was trying to keep track earlier when you were mentioning it. Um, from the prior report, what's the rough number of this uh, capital budget that is covering prior report issues? So on each of the um, pages, we usually identify which ones are, and we have an asterisk next to each of the projects that would be a K-8 prior facility report, we would have to actually add those up, but you can just go page by page and see which ones are in the prior report, the, the K-8 review uh, of facilities report, and which ones um, are not. And there are a few buckets that we use, and I think uh, Alicia alluded to it in the, um, in the presentation. There is a K-8 facility report where we're pulling projects from there. We also meet with um, our custodians, so Sam and Alicia met with our custodians, and sometimes there are things that the custodians see that were not in the prior report, but they're starting you know, to, to need replacement or repair. And so that is another area that we are always looking at because we want to be responsive to what our custodians see on a daily basis. They're really the experts in our in our facilities when it comes to that. So it's a combination <coughs> of, yeah, of the K-8 report and our custodians. Uh, sure, I think everyone hopefully understood the prior report was not gonna be uh, all encompassing because things are gonna come up yeah. as time goes by. So that's very understandable. Um, I would like if you get it whenever you can, just to give us an idea of what this is yes. because when talking about the uh, high school project, which we will be, in great detail. Um, one of the questions people kept having, are you still going to keep up with the prior report? And all the calculations that we put together do just that. So I want to make sure we're not missing anything that we should be keeping up with uh, so people could point and say, well, wait a minute, skip this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so I want to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing heading into uh, any decisions made on high school. Any other questions? Any final comments you want to I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight and your thoughtful review of our capital uh, recommendations. You know, we look forward to coming back uh, when we present our operating budget and just really thank, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for coming in and it's nice to actually see you. Yes, yeah, very nice. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. That is 7.23, and I believe this is the time we will be taking a flight break. Yes, we do. And before we leave, I mean, uh, we would look for a motion to make a tentative exception, uh, accepting of the Board of Education's capital budget. Uh, keeping in mind there will be further discussion also. I make a motion to tentatively accept the Board of Education's capital improvement request for 2021-2022. Joe Captain for a second. And just to be clear, this budget is the budget from the uh, form they gave us, which is 200 less than the other one. We need to mention that, Paula. It's in their presentation, three million seven thirty one one six six. Is that Okay, just that. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll take a recess.
Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. No. Now we will be moving to take a short adjournment. Uh, what do we think, Kathy? You got 30 minutes? I, I would say hopefully not that long. Hopefully not that long. Kathy wants with all these very quickly. Um, okay.
Okay. <coughs> we are returning at 7.52 to our meeting. And we will be starting with uh, the Kathy Blonson. Okay. So we have uh, uh, Keith Blonson, our director of fire risk and security, is here. First on for tonight, but again, just to kind of go over, we're going to be working off of this document right here that you know has all the capital. We're going to focus on the first year, but as the department head is here, if you have any questions on the out years too, I thought I'd just briefly go through the fire department first. So the fire department has a total and it's on C4, and we're working off the second column, requested 21, 20, 22. So the fire department has uh, five items. Uh, one of them is a turnout year, which is an item that we do every year, and that's a replacement. Then a $125,000 for a communication upgrade, $32,000 for Knox boxes, $100,000 for an 16 replacement, and $50,000 for uh, fire station renovation. And that would be to um, start the process on our, our main fire station. Steve, why don't you just kind of briefly go over um, the, the communication upgrade and the NOx boxes, because uh, I think those are a little bit more um, complicated. Sure, the communications upgrade is to upgrade the portables and mobiles in the fire apparatus. Um, this year we're upgrading all the apparatus at East Farmington Fire Station. Uh, the next phase um, for the 125,000 is going to upgrade Farmington and start to upgrade tungsten hose communications. And the Knox boxes are the encoders that are located on the fire apparatus that provide a master key so that the firefighters can have access to occupancies for emergencies. Um, and if there's not a key holder, they're not sitting on scene waiting for somebody to show up or have time to get immediate access to the building without causing any damage. And the communication upgrade project is we we're actually spreading that out into four years. And that's from the first year was last year, and then it's three years. Is there one of these here? I'm sorry, they don't have. Yeah, there's stuff. I will be request to uh, all members of the council. Uh, since we all pushed our microphones away in order to have dinner, or bring the microphone back in front of your face before you ask questions and speak. Did everyone have the information, Erica? Yeah, we is the fire station renovations. You know in the capital uh, plan and the strategic plan, this is something that the fire department has been working on. We've had two various studies done. Um, this would be to uh, kick off and get a building committee together and start with funding for an architect. So that would be for the fire station renovations. And you can look on the out years of that. You can see that it's you know, $4 million for the next year, $4 million and $3 million. Those are the projections for a fire station, uh, for all our fire stations for a renovation. Okay, so do we have any questions for Steve? Just on the replacement of Medic 16, how many miles do you have in that vehicle currently? 46,000? 26? 46. 46. Okay. Can you look to replace it this coming year? I'm sorry. This year, we've yeah. got some places, so we're like, we try to keep them under 50000 Is there a better resale value? or Actually, uh, we're looking to probably change to potentially an SUV. There's a committee being established to look at what they want to replace it with. Um, probably a more uh, economical, friendly vehicle. Um, it still provides the space that we need for the medical equipment that we carry in it. Okay, so change it from one vehicle to another. Would that change the price or would that increase the price? Uh, it would probably change the price, uh, but it's all off a state bid. So it really depends. And then if there's any extra work they want to do to it, slide out trays and, and you know, storage locations for the equipment. Okay, so change it out. Obviously, are we going down in price because we're going to an SUV or are we going up in price? SUV um, probably would be less in price if they went with that. But again, they're, they're weighing the options of whether they want to stick with the F550, which would be called the swap body, or they want to go with the SUV. Okay. So they haven't uh, made 100% determination yet. 
Okay, and again, but when they do so, what happens to the old Medic 16? Are we selling that? We would sell it. In? Yes. So what's, sell. The, what's the current price on a 15,000 mile vehicle? Uh, I believe when we sold it in Medic 7, Joe might know better, but we sold it to a department down south in Tennessee. I want to say we got 5000 for it. Really? Around there, something like that. Yeah. Joe, Joe would know better. Yeah, it, it depends on the vehicle and what the market is at the time. But I, think, I think that one was around 5000 um, It's a specialty vehicle, so you really need to find some, uh, either another department or you need to find somebody who is, um, you know, for whatever reason, they're going to take it. Okay. So we're just looking, that's as far as their X amount of year plan out? Yeah, so we do the smaller vehicles, usually do a 10 year replacement, and our larger vehicles, we do 20 year replacement. Okay. We have an average replacement plan, and like 16 is up on there. They're actually on 11 years now, so we've actually gone an extra year for them. Thank you. The vehicle's going to be 11 years old. Yes. Uh, just one question. Steve, uh, on the uh, Medic 16 replacement, are the departments still? Taken the path they want to do with the type of vehicle, or are we headed towards uh, suburbans versus going with the uh, Schwab bodies? It looks like we're making a move toward more suburban and SUV style vehicles. Why is that? Um, more dynamic, more economic. Uh, they're smaller, they're not as big and wide. You can obviously, get them in a smaller place. They're easier for our firefighters to drive, especially our newer EMTs. Uh, they don't have that large body on the back of it. Um, but it, because of the vertical space in the SUVs and Suburbans today, we can outfit it, you know, um, with the storage space we need. And they're going to hold up just as well with the amount of equipment we're going to put in the back of them, yeah. more interior-wise? Yeah, many departments are moved to SUVs for first responder vehicles for EMS. Okay. Other questions? Chris? Uh, yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, can you just talk about the communication upgrade plan generally in, in the out years? Would, so I sure. For this year, we're replacing about 46 portables, uh, five mobiles, and three station radios. And then for the following year, for the uh, request, we're looking to replace the rest at Punk So this this period that we're requesting this year is just up to do Farmington and start Punk Hose's communication. And then next year, we'll look to upgrade the rest of Punk Hose and start replacing the officer portables. Uh, all our officers have their own portables because they respond to their POV so they can sign out with dispatch. Uh, and they respond to the scene and give a size up and start the instant command process. So, um, and then after that, we look at doing the rest of the officers, uh, the fire marshal's vehicle, our safety officers, um, and then we're looking at um, the other two apparatus at Oakland Gardens for communications upgrades. Right, thank you. I got one. Okay, so, it's just Next year, up 2022, 23, 23, $75,000 for extra equipment. Is the town going to start replacing um, individual stations extra patient equipment now? Or? Yes, we're looking to, with the technology advances, we're looking to go to battery power, battery. e drive yep. tools. Yep. Uh, so this is the point of an education committee in process right now. They're demoing a bunch of different models. Yep. And on a town-wide basis, we're going to decide on one standardized type of extra equipment for all three main stations, all the stations. Excellent idea. Sure. Question for you. Is it worth us keeping uh, number 16 for another house? If we're only getting $5,000 for a sale? Um, the other house is Medic 7, so we could potentially look at replacing it, that, you know, 16 and replacing Medic 7, which is out at Oakland Gardens. Um, but we'd have to see as far as the maintenance goes. I mean, uh, Medic 16. Um, like that, about 46,000 miles. I think Medic 7 has about 55,000 or 60,000. Um, so we could potentially use it to replace that as a backup unit. Yeah, no, okay, it's still a fairly good vehicle. I'm driving a truck. My last truck had 210,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, other, the, the vehicles do go to medical calls. Uh, 2019 had 1,223 medical calls. The Tungsten so and this truck responded to 720 of those. So there's a lot of drive time, a lot of stop and go, fast speed, slow speed. So the, the trucks, while the mileage is low, it does take a, a pretty good beating going to emergency calls. So. And I'm sure there's a lot of idling hours. Though. Correct. Yes, sir. <coughs> Other questions? Receive. <coughs> yes. uh, yeah, on the, uh, for the 2122, the fire station renovation, this, this might have already been mentioned, but is that just for design, that 50,000, or? That's to go toward the potential uh, creating of a building committee for an architect or a site rep. It's really just startup money. Startup money. Startup money. Startup money. Yeah, to get maybe an architect on board and uh, 
start the process. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? And the turnout here, of course, every year we just do a 50,000. We're we'll rotating the turnout here each year. Yes, sir. Okay, see no other questions. Again, easy night, Steve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Big ticket items. Uh, we have, have had some 
Uh, people look at the trust will probably look at about a three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollar bridge repairs on that for structural repair coming up. And do you need to know your job? Uh by the Lily Field. The rails the trail. The rails the trail. Uh, the trestle over the river. <coughs> yep. <coughs> But the environmental compliance is basically a somewhat banking and then the stormwater. Correct. So we're, there's a DEP has put out an unfunded mandate probably about uh, six, 17 years ago now. Uh, and basically, we have to do comply with their requirements to make sure we're monitoring our stormwater discharges within town. Uh, we have to go and sample. We have to inspect. We have to clean all our catch basins every year, sweeping. Uh, part of our general duty is maintenance, but there's a whole laundry list of items of things that we have to report on every year, which we do, um, to make sure that we are still in compliance with this DEP mandate. Were we looking at to fill a position like last year to help you out with that? Uh, yes. Uh, what we've done, uh, we filled our civil engineer position, and we're going to hire a consultant. We need to some of this money to help us do all the sampling. We have uh, 758 outfalls that we have to inspect and uh, sample if they're during a wet weather flow. <laughs> we have over uh, 4,200 catch basins in town that we're, required, we're supposed to clean every year. Uh, one thing that's helped us out with that is by changing to a straight salt for our winter uh, storm prep instead of using a 50 50 or a 12 to 3 sand, uh, salt ratio. We don't have a lot of sand to get in our catch basins every year. So help that help reduce and improve our catch basin and our discharge. So the one thing I wanted to put on is we do have a $2 million bond for the roads. And Russ does have a map um, that we're going to put on the screen. One thing I, we talk about this every time that we show a map. And the roads that are going to be done, the roads are projected. Remember, I always just say that this is a fluid document. Things do come up. And so, you know, we, Russ and Scott, and with Scott, they do a really good job of um, going to the different neighborhoods. But again, this uh, document, we always get nervous about showing it because sometimes it does change. So, Anna, if you could put up that document and then Russ can go through it. <coughs> One of the most anticipated moments <laughs> of the year. <laughs> thought it was the shortest. This is the one that I sweat the most on. <laughs> so you'll see here, and we have in season one. Can you slide that up a little bit? Thank you. Um, so basically, we break we break the paving year down to three seasons: the spring, the summer, and the fall. And in this, we call them season one, season two, and season three, just to make it simpler. Um, season one, the first in the spring, we're going to start off and pave uh, Oak Ridge Dunwood Court. So that'll be our first go around. If people remember, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Oak Ridge has been on the paving schedule for about 10 years. We've been back and forth waiting for CNG to make a determination if they were going, if they were going to extend the gas and not extend the gas. They were going to, they weren't going to. So we've been back and forth with them. Um, and we, last fall, we ended up paving Stonegate and Briar Hill in preparation for doing the finishing that neighborhood. Uh, the CNG did not extend the gas. They did not feel it was warranted, not enough interest. So we're going to do that first thing. We will then go to Devonwood, which will be the final paving uh, from Route 4 into the gazebo, which is in Season 2. And this area here uh, will go from the gazebo up to the phase four uh, paving line. You'll see in the red, the darker red right here, that's all been complete. Everything in red is complete. So that'll round out Devonwood. And then season three, if you could, yeah, we start over here. And what, can you move slide over to that way, Anna? There was, um, do you want to do that? Yes, please. We're over in here, <coughs> in Unionville. Uh, those two areas, one over here, we 
with Rhonda Rodenberg here. As Kathy says, we, you know, I would love to pave more roads every year, but there's just not enough time. Uh, we do a thorough review. Our list changes based on the winters we have. Uh, Robin and Berkshire should have been probably paved last year. Um, it's really getting in bad shape. However, uh, the Britain Water Company is extending water on Batterson Park Road and making that connection. They're going to put stubs, a stub out on Berkshire and on Winterwood. So they're going to, we're going to work with them to see if they're going to extend it. It doesn't make sense for us to go in and pave then have them come in and dig it up and put the utility in. So we will do any patching that we need to do to get us through that area. And if, we, if they're going to come sooner than later, we're going to jump back and go over to the Woodruff, Woodruff Road area, which was on our list for last year, but with COVID, we delayed a little bit. Uh, so that's still a priority for us. So we're kind of juggling the paving shift depending on the utilities. And I stress we always work with you know, the water companies, the gas companies, whoever, just to make sure that we're uh, you know, we're coming after they kind of do any upgrades to their facility. It doesn't make sense for us to pay and then they go around And Joe, remind us for this update how much money do we have left? Uh, right now we have about a million dollars left from the previous bond. And that will take us for one season? Um, yeah, that'll probably take you through uh, one, and a, one and a half of those three seasons. So it'll take you through half of, of this paving program. Right. And, and so. we've been doing two million about every other year. Correct. So if, if the bond doesn't pass, <coughs> Regroup and see what we need to do to figure out where we can go and get the best bang for our buck. There's one thing that we, you know, we've learned years ago working with the uh, CIP from the state, or the VIP, excuse me, is there's a mobilization fee. So for the contractor to come in, if we have them paid, say, on you know, Oak Ridge, then we have them go over to Robin, then we have them come back to Devon when we're paying mobilization. And, you know, we're, we try and get the more time you put down, the cheaper the price. So you stay in the neighborhood. We try to finish a neighborhood before moving on. That way, that neighborhood is complete. There's no, and just from a record keeping standpoint, the neighborhood's done. Years and years ago, it used to be you know you paved a little bit of one street, a little bit of another street, and it was very difficult to go back and figure out what was done. And Scott and I learned years ago that we do the neighborhood as a whole and then move to another neighborhood. And we try to maintain you know equality between. The 085 and the 032 just to make sure everyone is getting a fair share. Okay. Other questions for engineer? Our roads. And none of your roads are getting paved while you're here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next item is uh, Highway and Brown, I think. Highway and Brown is on page 3. And we have uh, three. Three items. One is irrigation improvement. One of them is uh, one of our larger dump trucks that we do snow with. And one of them is a tool cat, which is in our park department. So it's three pieces of equipment um, that we are looking for for the highway department. So I don't know if you have any specific questions on those. Questions on the three pieces of equipment? Gary has one that was going on. Gary. Uh, Russ, thanks for coming out. Um, our oldest truck we have on the road right now following snow is? 1986. Wow. With how many miles? Uh, well over 100,000. Yeah, it's a uh, old Mac that we just keep put, keep it on the road. Uh, it's a you know, good truck, but it's, it's due. So, and what we do is we, we've had a few trucks that uh, we bought in the last 20 years. Um, that they weren't, you know, when they say they don't build them like they used to, there's some of them that we got rid of just because they didn't build them like they used to. But that's their oldest one. Um, I have talked to this year. You guys did a great job. Appreciate it. Let's hope it's all done. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, CJ. Uh, Russ, uh, with the dump truck there, I'm just noticing that, like, uh, for 21-22, you're requesting 
then the following year it's 200,000, then 205, and then it gets all the way up to 210. Is that an anticipation of the increased cost of buying a new truck, or, or can you explain that? Absolutely. Uh, it's an anticipation of the cost going up. Mm -hmm. Also, the new emissions requirements are making trucks more expensive. Thank you. That's the reason for it. Other questions on the I have one other. Just, uh, just uh, I'm looking ahead here, 2022-2023, uh, we're going to start Tungsis Meet. What, what would we be, what would be the initial phase of that? If, or is it too early? Wait, if I could just interrupt you, Peter, because before we get to that one, is that we have two other accounts, and yeah. one of them is with deals with Tungsis Meet, so maybe I'll talk about that, and then we're going to finish All right. Meet. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. work on that. So Good. we have... Um, we have on O is Tungsis Meet Improvement for $100,000, and that's from other funds. And Joe, maybe you can just explain where that O is from. That's going to be from uh, the state of the grant program called LOSIP. We get about $130,000 a year, and we've been using some of that money for uh, various projects on the sidewalks and, and Farmington Center is learning for that. And we're also going to put some of that money towards uh, this, this project that Tungsis Meet. And the thought for this part of the $100,000 is to um, do the skateboard park over. Yep. And I know some of you have heard it about it. It's really not it's in rough shape, and we decided to make that a priority just because it's very it's in rough shape and it needs to, it needs to be uh, attended to. But bringing me to Tungsis Mead, you remember that um, we did a, a facility study on Tungsis Mead, and one of the issues that, you know, as a council, you're going to have to talk about is that the Tungsis Mead uh, work you know, it's, you know, slated at $4.5 million. And, you know, when you're trying to even putting in $500,000 a year or $400,000 a year is a big chunk of the amount of money that we need for our overall budget. So, you know, there's, we have the facility report and it's broken out, um, but there's extensive amounts of work that needs to be done in tons of need. And so, you know, $4.5 million, you know, putting $500,000 in, really on the target that you guys are giving us, um, it just, it's difficult to start funding comes with me. So it's something to talk about. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a bond later on or something along those lines, or we really make an effort that we have to really talk about it and start put, putting cash away every year to really start addressing um, the situation there. So next year, you're just banking money? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then the only other item I wanted to just mention too was a uh, highway maintenance truck, and that's an R, that's a reappropriation, and Joe, maybe you can tell them where that money is coming from. Sure. Every year, um, for the at the end of every year, we look to see what capital balances we have left over from various projects, and we do have about $75,000 left over in various equipment purchases, previous year's equipment purchases from the highway and grounds department. So what we're proposing is to accumulate those all together and reappropriate them to buy the um, highway maintenance truck. So um, the you know, leftover balances come from the heavy duty dump trucks, they come from other highway maintenance trucks, uh, they come from any, any of the equipment that we buy for the highway department. This is something, actually I think I came to you last year or the year before, and we did an appropriation at the end of the year where we moved a lot of the un unexpended balances in the CIP towards other projects. So it's something we do every year. We're just supposed to do it as part of the process, of the capital budget process, instead of instead of waiting to the end of the year. Yeah, and as you know, with uh, the limited capital funds last year, we are trying to at least I mean, you know, keep up with our equipment. The demand is more than what we fund, but I think between doing this other fund and also reappropriating the money, we're not going too far behind and we're able to get the equipment that we need. Especially, I think, like the, the expense of equipment, the snowplow. Joe, could you just revise the, uh, what are the restrictions on reappropriating those funds? Is it in capital? Um, it's up to the council to reappropriate them. It's any of the balances once the project is closed out. Um, usually, I wait about a year after the project to make sure it is close, truly closed out, and then I come back to the council, or we come back to the council and through a formal transfer process, the council would move the money. They would both move the money from one project to another project. 
but it will generally stay within capital. Yes, um, we generally keep these in capital, and we try to fund other capital projects like we're doing here. Yeah. If we didn't do the reappropriation of the 75, then you would see this as a, a request for a cash outlay for 75 to replace the vehicle. So this you know, this holds down the capital budget more in the long run. The only um, and, and again, this is money that's appropriated through the through the budget process. Bond funds are totally or, or grant funds are a totally different animal. Uh, bond funds we have to go through. A, a totally different process, and grants you would actually have to turn the money back to the state, the state, but that's where we got the money from. Great. Thank you. Other questions? I think we're going to... Is no one going to ask about the toolcat? Go ahead. What's the toolcat? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, uh, it's a piece of equipment that we bought, uh, when did we get that, like an 05? That's the DP grant. Yeah. yeah, we got that through a DP grant back in 2005. Um, it, it's, a, it's a machine that is basically like a go-kart. It's like a uh, cushion that you see up at the golf course, and it's got a trailer in the back, and it, it has five or six different attachments. You can uh, drill holes for fencing, you can plow with it, you all equip all tools with it. Um, we use it primarily for the maintenance of the trail. Okay, great. I see no other questions. Great. Then the next one under us is um, the planning department, and that is uh, that's on page C4, and that's a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for Farmington Center improvement. And that is something that we've all been recently discussing, and that is um, we're wanted to make sure that we have enough money so we can have our replacement sidewalk and we can get to Highland Park Market. And so this is just to make sure of that, and uh, that's what this is for. So these are the sidewalks in the village? Correct. Okay. Any questions on the plan? Next to the near the golf course, the yeah. pretty stone built. We took a nice tour of that building last yes. year. Yes. 
Um, that is, I mean, that is a building. I, I know that I, I feel strongly that we really need to make it now for, I think, two years. Yep. Uh, probably a little over. Two years that we really need to start um, putting some work into it and um, getting, you know, start uh, doing some work on it. <laughs> um, for the youth center renovations, Nancy, why don't you describe that? The youth center, we just had an architect this past year who did an analysis of the um, of the entire building and actually came up with the same type of phasing. In the youth center, our key point in the youth center that we need to work on is down here in the basement. It has some flooding and some mold and mildew issues that really should be addressed first. So that would be the first thing that we would start with. Questions on stone outs or the youth center? Nancy, just for the um, youth center, what programs are going on over there after you did? At the youth center is um, our teen center, the fun cops, um, you know, a variety of programs coming in. I like a variety as well for recreation. Okay. And what do we see going on with the stone house when that's included? Well, the stone house right now actually has occupants that live there, upstairs, and then downstairs is supposed to be a meeting area. One of the big things we would like to do is fix that outside porch area and, yeah. and have that as, again, more meeting space um, and then the inside. It's really, as you guys, I think we did go inside. It's yeah. really not that big, large in there, but really just clean that up for some meeting space and then the outside space, having that really for some community space. And at the stone house, the cement in front of where Kathy's referring to, it's just really chipped away. and. <coughs> It's even hard to open the door. It needs quite a bit of repair right there. Oh, you can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the video can't hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry. As I recall last year, uh, when we took the tour, when we were having the same discussion last year, uh, there was a lot of uh, mortar work to be done mm -hmm. and uh, risking the leaks, which anytime you're getting a leak, or even as you're talking about in front, uh, you go through a winter and it's a compounding problem. So as long as we put it a long way, put it off, the bigger that ticket I assume is going to be repaired. Absolutely. Uh, any questions for you? Anything else? Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Uh, I make a motion for a tentative approval of the community and recreational services account for the capital expenditure. Joe Cappy, Carl, second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any none? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Next up, we have Paula Lanson, Chief of Police, and the Police Department is on page C5. Technology in years past 
um, has been such that really it would have been wasting money. And what we're seeing now is those agencies who had body cameras um, have been now need to get all new body cameras, uh, just like in, you know the technology. Um, the technology works now uh, very well, and so it, it would be the time for us probably to start looking at that. It is required that we have them, and we have them in place by June 30th of 22. So in this ne next fiscal year, we have to have body cameras and have them implemented by state law. So um, this would, oh, this, uh, we, we already have the in-car cameras, so really this is just for body cameras and also for one year of cloud storage. Uh, it should be noted that every year it's going to be about $40,000 for cloud storage for the body cameras, and that'll be a recurring fee. Um, Chief, on that, the 180 minus out the 40, is that the total cost for, there's no other technology in there, right? Correct. This is 100% for the body cameras. All right, Chief. Good, all right. Good, thanks for coming. I asked our representative Slap and D'Amico about possible funding coming from the state. I haven't heard back from them yet. Have you heard anything since uh, you're probably more involved? So, uh, interesting you say that. Um, <laughs> I had spoken to uh, the woman from OPM, uh, from the state, who does this grant funding. Um, and we are supposed to get up to 30% is what is in the law right now. Um, she uh, informed me and, and I informed the Chiefs of Police uh, for the state of Connecticut that uh, the bonding has not been approved for this new round of police body camera funding. Um, so I guess it's in the state's bonding and it's not been approved. So the application for that funding and reimbursement um, is not available yet. Um, but in the law, it says that we would get up to 30% of reimbursement for it. Now, it is a reimbursement, so you have to spend the money and then show them that you have them um, and that you actually are using them, and then they'll reimburse you up to 30%. But, it, but currently, uh, those funds are not available. Okay, and you're saying up to 30%. Is there other language in there that may not get us to 30%? No, uh, the hope is that, um, so they've already done a survey from all the police departments on potentially our costs. And um, so I've, I've submitted this to, to the state so that they know across the whole state about what the, the liability for, for the bond would be. Um, and so uh, certain cities are getting up to 50%. Um, and so there's uh, there, there's kind of a breakout um, where we fall would be up to thirty percent. And how, how do, what, what makes us fall into that criteria? Is it by population, by size of force, by? Nope. Uh, it is uh, it's an economic. Um, yeah, I'm not sure the exact term, but it's uh, it's it's an economic okay. thing. The economics of the community. Yes, the economics of the community. Thank you. They're probably looking at ability to pay, and if they feel we have Yeah, there was a term used in that, and I should have brought. I have another binder with the state statute and all the language. I could have given you the exact language, but it's, it's, that's what it falls to. Is is that a, uh, the uh, municipalities of lesser means, but whatever they use for that. So you feel comfortable we would get? You keep saying up to thirty percent is the word, but they seem to indicate it would be thirty percent. Yes. Plus the most, yeah. that's about 54 grand after the fact. So that could pay for the next year's one year worth of cloud storage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Thank you, Chief Kamau. Uh, a question for you. that body cameras for every officer we have, or are we rotating them? Yes, it would be a body camera for every officer. Which, um, so obviously body cameras have been around for a while, and speaking to many of the other chiefs and um, at seminars, they find that that's the way to do it because you, you know, don't forget officers sometimes are held over on cases, right? And sometimes they're ordered in. Sometimes uh, you have a, a, a serious situation where you're calling people in. They need to have their own body cameras, um, and and they need to have them available every time. So they'll be issued to the officer. They'll each have their own body camera that they maintain. Great, thank you. So how many body cameras is there? So it'll be 60 body cameras, oh, I'm sorry, it'll be 50 body cameras. 
And the thing with that is that we need some spares um, because <laughs> the reality of it is they, by the state law, uh, they have to have the body camera. So saying that it's broken is not um, an option. So we have to have spares so that if it does break, that we can then replace it immediately. Chief, does that include your administrative staff? So if a hot call came in, uh, your captain goes out, your lieutenant comes out, they have to have one automatically. Yes, so we'll all be wearing them. Yep. So all sworn officers. All sworn officers who deal with the public. Including yourself. Yes. Wow. What, what are, um, this is just, uh, for communities who do not meet the deadline of uh, July 30th, 2022, what, what are the, what are the penalties? Uh, they hold back on funding to towns or something because they're not adhering to the law. Is, what yeah. happens if we don't meet that thing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I don't know what the, you know, I always try and make sure that I, I hit the, uh, the marks of the law, um, but I don't know what the, what the repercussions would right. be. I, I would imagine if they would probably impact your grant funding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, CJ. Um, <clears throat> Chief Melanson, uh, good to see you. Um, my question is on the cloud storage. Is that a limited data storage space, or is it for a certain amount? Like, is there is there a possibility that in the future we would exceed if there's a if it's, if it's limited to a certain size, a certain number of gigabytes, is there the possibility in the future that we would exceed that and have to go beyond the 40,000 in the future? Um, so no, it is, it is unlimited um, because you can imagine the hours and hours and hours of video that are going to be captured on these body cameras. Um, so it's unlimited storage, but I think that we are well enough aware that once we have this system and it's in place that those fees will probably go up um, significantly because, you know, obviously body cameras are becoming more the norm in law enforcement and uh, I, I do foresee that, you know, they're going to, those rates will rise, obviously, for that storage. Thank you. One more, TK. You know, good. Since you said that, Chief, I know like for the cruisers, they're activated by light, speed, so how is it going to be activated for the on-person camera? Motion, or is it running 24-7 no matter what? So um, that, that's a great question, Joe, thanks. Um, so they are tied into the, uh, they will be synced with the in-car uh, video for those officers who have in-car video. Those admin who don't have in-car video uh, or some PJ cars, there are certain cars that do not have video, the detective cars, those you have to turn on and off. It is always recording though. Um, so if you forget to turn it on, you go back and it'll pre-record a certain portion. Um, so even though it's off, it's actually always recording. Okay, so, so if the officer is at most of speed during a soccer game, he doesn't have it on, so if this happens, he forgets to activate it, they can go back and grab it. That yeah, and, and, and that's a great point. So if, well, let's say you were you know, at, a, at a soccer event and all of a sudden a fight breaks out. Now your, your body camera, you wouldn't have it on just watching the soccer game, right? Um, it's for when you're interacting with the public in a law enforcement capacity. Um, so he, wouldn't have to, he or she would not have it on at that point. But all of a sudden a fight breaks out. Well, you're not, you know, I know the older officers, it's going to take some time to... <laughs> remember to turn it on as you're doing these things, so it'll be some muscle memory. Um, our hopes is that the younger officers will grow up with it and basically do it automatically. But even though they miss it, um, they'll be able to go back and then uh, record it after the fact. It's called, actually that's the actual term, record after the fact. So, yeah. um, How long do we have to, uh, how long do we have to retain this, this uh, this video, how many years or is perpetuity? So, um, so th there's a minimum guidance um, from the state, um, and it basically is two years for most uh, uh, incidences, um, but anything uh, 90 days for anything that doesn't turn out to be. So, uh, you had a broken down car, and I stop. I have to turn my body camera on because I'm going to interact with you at your broken down car. After 90 days, that can automatically delete um, oh. if we don't uh, 
you know, check it out. If I go to a domestic violence call, that has to be saved for two years. So uh, there's classifications for all of these, and, and the good part is this will integrate with our in-car. We already do this with the in-car cameras, that they, they get labels depending on what it is. If it's a domestic violence call, if it's an arrest, if it's a, they automatically get labeled, and based on the label is how long it will be retained. Okay, all right, so that answered my other question. I was going to just ask uh, for an officer who had an uneventful night um, that that body camera footage would be delayed, uh, deleted in 90 days. Correct. Okay. So, Chief, do you have to create another position now for someone to go through all this? I can imagine how much footage you're going to have daily to go so, through and clean out on, on your time periods. So it's interesting, um, and we haven't addressed that yet. Um, it, and we'll, it, it's going to be very interesting. To your point, um, larger agencies or medium-sized agencies have a staff of uh, you know at least one, sometimes five people, who all they do is go through this video to make copies, either for the courts or now. Let's not forget, there's an arrest. Four officers were there. Somebody has to go through that video, download all four of their, uh, not only their dash cams for the cruisers, but also their body cameras, and then release it to the court. That is the easy part, because the court can get the whole unedited version. It's when the media or somebody else requests a copy. Somebody now has to go through those hours and hours of video to remove minors, uh, pictures of dead bodies, victims of sexual assault, and there's a whole category of, of things that you have to remove from those videos before you release them. The question becomes, how does a municipality or town pay for it? So I will tell you there's two theories to that. One, um, the idea from Las Vegas PD, uh, what they do is they tell you it's about how long and they hire a company out. So for FOI, you can charge uh, the person requesting it the cost uh, for the municipality. So if somebody requested that video, we would hire a company and say, okay, this is what they want. For you to go through those hours of video, what is it going to cost them? Let's say it's $1,000. Well, that person can choose to have it done or not. So I know that works for like Las Vegas because then it reduces some of the requests for video. Um, so we're, we'll see. We did not have, for our in-car camera, we did not have a huge request for in-car. The problem with the body cameras and what a lot of agencies are seeing is, I get stopped by an officer. I think he was rude to me. What do I then do? I say, hey, I want all his body camera footage for the last 90 days. Well, guess what? We have to give it to him. So we have to go through 90 days of body camera footage and remove those that are protected by law that we cannot release, and then release the other one. So, that's where they're seeing big problems. New York PD had an issue with this, um, that exactly what I just described. Um, and so uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the future. So that, that's a great point, Joe, and we did not allocate anything for that right now. If we start getting inundated requests, our idea is rather than purchase redaction software, is to hire a company and say, hey, if you want it, it's going to cost you $10,000. It's going to cost you $15,000. That way the taxpayers aren't paying for, um, you know, something uh, that, you know, depending on what it is. Right. So, so, uh, so in terms of saying, so just about everything that officer has as a could possibly be an FOI request to see. So is there protocols already established for medical calls, check out the well-being, stuff like that, they won't be released? Juveniles, obviously, you said because if they fall into the juvenile status. Okay. So it's only the things that are protected in, in law, and I actually uh, have a policy here um, that, that uh, so there's a model policy, which is the minimum requirement from the state that we have to have. And uh, basically they outline the things uh, that you're not allowed to release. And in this 32-page policy, I'm sure I can find it if you were, but, but it's those sorts of things. Thank you. Uh, okay, seeing none, I would just uh, recommend everyone contact our state reps and mention that $180,000 new bills we have and see what they can do to 
to help us get something. Only that 30 percent. Uh, anything else? No. All right. Thank you very much. Can I hold you one second? Can sure. That's about the um, shooting range. Yes. So. Um, <laughs> So the, um, the the shooting range needs a new roof. Um, obviously, uh, we were supposed to do it last year um, and just kind of ran out of time and, and funding. Um, but besides that, the inside was flooded um, a couple of years back, and we never really we kind of dried it out, fixed some of the sheetrock, but it is um, in really bad shape in the in the bathroom. And as uh, Joe can attest, I mean, it is it's really bad. It's time to. Uh, you know, we really thought it was a priority this year to try and clean it up um, and, and get it into more usable. Um, and obviously, there is going to be a lot of training going on in this next year in that uh, I'm sure most of you have heard about the use of force bill and the new um, use of force law that is going to be enacted. Um, and so there is going to be a lot of use of force training going on in this next year. So we're going to be using that Obviously, the range and uh, simunitions. Uh, and uh, was it two years ago that the um, uh, you approved the Milo machine for us, which is a simunitions or s simulation type of, and really that's going to be required. So agencies that don't have that are going to have to go seek one out and find one to use. So I'm glad that we have that because it's going to be required in the new law. Um, or the new policy um, by post that you actually have hands-on training, that it's not just classroom and going to a fire range, fire range, but you actually do scenario-based training. So we're ahead of that curve and we're ready and we do it right now and have it. So the cost that we shared with West Hartford, are we doing like, hey, they, they take care of us for their in-house training, we're helping them out when they come to our range to, uh, you know, to their West Hartford school training? Yes, and they also have a uh, a simulation machine, right. a Milo machine. But as far as the range, they do, so um, for those of you who don't know, um, every year our officers have to go to a week-long training, that's the minimum, and we do it through West Hartford In-Service School is what we call it. Um, the firearms for that school are conducted uh, in Farmington, but the classroom and all the other portions of it are in West Hartford. We don't pay a fee for that, so it's kind of we use their instructors, get that training, we get our EMT, our uh, NCIC research, uh, all those training things that we get, um, and so it's kind of shared. Uh, different departments bring different things to the table, and the one thing that we bring to the table is the firing range uh, for that. Okay. And my last one, have we looked up, I know back in the day when I was there, there was a talk about moving the range over to the old Silcott site, and uh, back then the tech chief couldn't come to an agreement with Silcott, blah, blah, blah. Any thought or talk about maybe choosing a different site due to the flooding issue that we do have at this current site? So I and I did try and um, uh, do that with Tilcon um, because Tilcon has much more property. Obviously, uh, there's just the location, the yardage that we would have, the backdrop of the the rock cliffs and and those sorts of things, um, and they just were unable to come to a deal to let us use it as a shooting range. So our snipers are able to use it on a, uh, you know, a per occasion basis, um, but it's it's not allowed to be used daily. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Appreciate it. Other questions for the Chief? Okay. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. I make a motion to tentatively uh, accept the police department's capital improvement budget. Joe Cabot, Carol, second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's enough. The next department we're going over is the town manager, and that is on page B5. We have Brian Rush, our IT manager, joining us here as well. So everyone knows it's Brian Rush who sends those phishing schemes out there trying to con us into clicking on things. <laughs> we got a bunch from you out there. <laughs> <laughs> so we 
have one, two, three, four, five items um, for the for general fund cash appropriations. We have $150,000 in technology, uh, $100,000 in town hall improvements, $50,000 for building equipment improvements, $260,000 for revaluation, and $30,000 for land records and re-indexing. So maybe I'll just briefly go over all of them. I'll start with the land records and re-indexing for $30,000. And that's uh, from Paula's account. And that one we talk about every year. It's a very popular account. And Paula, maybe you can just briefly describe how far along we are on it. And during COVID, this has been one that we're really happy that we have in funding it because it's used. And um, Paula? Uh, this is a continuation, as Kathy said, of the project that we've been doing for of about eight years now, and this will actually bring us back into the 19, late, or 1945 to 1950. And it's been a wonderful uh, project this past year because uh, almost exclusively people are able to search for the land records um, off-site on the internet, and we've been very fortunate to have that. And they, and the public like really a very popular program. So. Um, the next item is $260,000 for revaluation funds, and this will begin to be used to begin the process of reappraising all of real property by October 1st, 2022. Um, every time we think we're done with revaluation, it's back again. <laughs> so um, it's an expense, and, and, it, and it is expensive. So that's another item. Um, $50,000 for building and equipment improvements. This fund I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, and I'm not sure if any of the council people have been on when we have had that account, and I'll have Joe. Um, with our buildings and equipment, um, it's expensive if things break down unexpectedly. Um, fire trucks, um, highway plows, things of that nature. And in the past, I don't know, Joe, did we start maybe five or six years ago? I lost track of time. It's probably close to 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we started to put um, some money in an account, a banking account, and then what would happen is that when we've had some of those unexpected repairs in our buildings or in um, our equipment, we would use those funds instead of taking the money which was unbudgeted out of the um, operating budget. And that that money lasted up until, I think, last year, Joe? Um, yes, it actually it lasted until this year. Uh, we finally ran out this past uh, summer when we had some mechanical problems that problems over at the police department that caused us to use the last of the money. And it, it does work out well because it's, instead of having our operating budget with <coughs> extra money in it, we use this account and we built it and we only use it. But, you know, like for the police department when we had our issue, it could be nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a truck. It could be that much money. And so this is an account we'd like to start building up again. Um, so that's what that, um, that's what that is. Um, $100,000 in town hall improvements. This is a banking account and also we're spending it. And the, primarily the funds are being used for multi-phase for security at the town hall. Um, I think we may have talked about it at some other time, but one of the things that has actually had with COVID is that this, we've um, accelerated some of the issues that we've had to be dealing with with town hall security. And that has helped us along with um, doors being closed and some various things. But right now we're looking to have all our doors being keyed, have electronic system, have security cameras. Erica, what else is on the list? Yeah, um, just more um, call buttons for different places. Um, a lot of, of the expenses in the video cameras and the, in the key fob system. And we're also redoing all the exterior doors except for the front. So it is really, it is an issue, I mean, with the COVID, it helps because one of the things is that we've had a security consultant come in and obviously, you know, our building is open, it's very open and it's not secure. And so we have to really make some changes to it. And I think the key system where employees are going to have the doors are going to be shut and you're going to have a uh, key system to get in and out. And that was something I was a little bit hesitant about before COVID, but now we're somewhat used to having our doors shut. So I think that is, you know, kind of a blessing. But that is what the town hall improvements are for. And the $150,000 in technology would be used for upgrading a server infrastructure replacement, which is a joint project with the Board of Ed, a partial phone system upgrade at town hall, 
Staples House in the Highway Garage, and the purchase of a, a network prevention system to improve network security, and that is why I have Brian here to explain what all of that is. Yeah, um, so the network security prevention system, um, it would be used to purchase a new line intrusion prevention system would improve network security by actively looking for network traffic to identify potential intrusions and irregular activity on our network. So a security type of system. Yeah, so right right now we have we have an IPS intrusion prevention system in our firewall that's that's detecting the traffic that's coming from the outside in or inside out, but it's not actually looking at the traffic that's falling on our network. And our phone systems? Uh, yeah, our phone systems were installed in 2012. Um, we're looking for $40,000 to just replace the uh, handsets. Uh, we've been doing various upgrades to the software side of it, um, but the handsets are, are eight years old at this point and they're starting to get pretty beat up. So we're looking at replacing those at Town Hall, Staples House, and Highway. And then there's also another $35,000, which would be like a banking account, um, to do town hall rewiring um, with you know, network cables and everything to, to computer locations. Um, basically, the wiring that's in this building has been here for over 20 years. Uh, certain drops are starting to fail, and it's about time we look at rewiring. What is the project we've been working with on the board, with the board bed? So the, the project with the board bed, we've been putting money to the side um, every year to uh, replace some of our, our server infrastructure um, for our virtual servers. Um, this past year, we bought some new storage for it. Um, we're probably looking at adding a new host, a new server at here and up at the high school um, for this year. And this is kind of like just a bank account that we're planning on doing a larger project in fiscal year 24-25. One of the things I know that, again, I think it's a positive, and I, I wasn't even sure if the board mentioned it, but it does really work out well with the board and the town kind of having to join IT, and they work together and they do various projects. And again, it support system too with us, uh, Matt Ross and his group and Brian and uh, Todd. So, um, it is something that we collaborate and work together quite a bit with the board on various things. So that works out well with us for us. And that's it for our side. Questions? Uh, yeah, my question is uh, for Paula, actually, on the land records reindexing. Um, so just looking at the, the seven years here, I see that the the last year that we're planning for 30,000 is fiscal year 24-25. So does that mean that we will be completely uh, re-indexed, uh, digitized uh, by the end of that year? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, the that's an approximation, the 30,000. It's just out there for the because after this year, the, coming up next year, mm -hmm. we're going to be moving from the type of indexing that we know now, modern indexing, into our very old book. And I haven't really even talked to them yet to get estimates of what it would cost to go back to the first. It may not be able to be done. I'd like to go back to the 1920s if I could, uh, but we'll just have to see. This is, this is just to put a place in a home to keep the project going. Gotcha. So approximately, I guess, how far back, what year would, um, uh, would what, what's in the seven-year um, capital improvement plan, how far back would that get us? Um, I'd like to think it would get us back to the 1920s. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for the template? Wow. Uh, Paul, how long is, uh, how long has this been going on? I think about seven or eight years. Okay. Great. Good thing you got a good head start on the before COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. The, uh, all right. And just uh, for the public knowledge and the reval, um, how has this number been changing over the years? I mean, we're looking at 260 this year and 100 next year. Um, how have the costs changed over time? 
Can you answer that? Sure. Um, this is actually is very similar to the cost from the last time. Um, it has, there hasn't been a lot of change. And what, what's actually been occurring is most of this is now being done. Um, it, it's being done basically site inspections, but not interior inspections. So it's basically been drive-bys of, of homes. It would be very similar to what we did the last time. The we'll drive-by, we'll walk the neighborhood, take pictures of the homes. And we'll also send up data mailers to all the homes and ask people to verify the information that we have on the property record cards. Because of that, and because the growth in the number of parcels hasn't been that great since the last revel, we estimate that the cost will be very similar. And we, we actually went out to other towns to see what they were getting, uh, towns that have been doing revels in the past year or two, what they've been paying per parcel, and, and we just went along with those, those costs. Um, the, the only problem we run into with revals right now is there's a very limited number of companies doing them. So if they get busy and, and they're you know, they're really into it, then the, the price goes up. So, but um, right now we hope if we start in May of this year, that gives us plenty. Of, we're talking October, being ready for October of 2022, so we're, you know, a year and a half away. So getting them started now, we'll, we'll be able to get in line, get a, a good company. And, and, and give them the t enough time to do the rebound without rushing it. Great. Appreciate you giving that up. Any other questions for the town managers? Seeing none. I make a motion to tentatively approve the town manager's capital improvement budget. Joe, have it for a second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Very nice walk through on your first round of capital, you know. We'll now move on to item. Can you, can you, oops. Yeah, I just wanted to just do a little wrap up. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so move up. Gone through the capital budget, and I just want to again something that just what we talked about um, in the um, at the beginning that you know our town policy is usually funding at 2.5 percent, and we are proposed at 3.64 percent. So again, it's it's a substantial increase. Um, we're working on the budget for March 9th, and the entire capital budget will be in the. Um, and propose my town manager's proposed budget. So I think that you all should be uh, expecting with a, a putting four million two hundred twenty-seven one hundred sixty-six in into the capital, you're going to see a high budget coming through. So um, just to be aware of that, and uh, I just wanted to know that, and then we'll talk more about it the week of March. And that, as usual, I'll be prepared. You know, we'll prioritize some of our items um, and go through it. So. Already at the March 9th week. Very good. I appreciate that. And the um, just to that point, uh, what did you say the percentage is we're at right now with this? We're at 3.64. We are our, our lowest, we're supposed to be at at least 2.5. I was in my head kind of going what my proposal is, was at about 3%. Do you have the numbers for 2.5 and 3.5? Yeah, 2.5, the entire capital budget would be 2,822,000. 3 million, it would be, I mean, 3% would be 3,386,000. And we're right now at 3.64, which is 4,227,166. Okay. Um, Now, ready? Agenda item E2, I make a motion to set a special town council meeting on February 25th, 2021 at 7 p.m. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes. It's just that I left the agenda on your places. Um, it is going to be a Zoom meeting, um, and it's Thursday. So is this Thursday for Zoom meeting? 
Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Item F, executive session. Seeing none, before we move to adjournments, I will give you our quote of the evening by uh, Anthony de San Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince. As for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. With that, I make a motion to adjourn the February 23rd, 2021 Town Council meeting. Joe Cameron, for a second. Motion second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You are adjourned.